Mr. A here, saying, how y'all doing? Yo! Are you ready to rumble? Or should I say tumble? Cause I don't stumble or bumble like a Greg or Brian Gumbo. Standing on the ground, black feet down, killing worms and drugs. And I'm doing it on my terms. Welcome to the Rumble. We are back and better than ever helping you stay ready so you don't have to get ready. We don't want you sucker punched, so we're here each and every week helping you keep your guard up. I am Jeremy Lavelle with Remedy Claims Consulting at Claims Coach on Instagram and TikTok. And they just call me the mouth of the South. And alongside of me, once again, is the catastrophe queen, the Claims Day Miss, uh, Jessica O'Dell, and the, and the salaritously superlative, the cerebrally ceremonial. The one, the only, Ms. Baby Cakes, Donna Lavelle. How's everybody doing today now that I actually can get the intro out of my mouth? <laughs> Good. I might keep all of those in. I have no, man, it's like I got there and it just, it, I mean, the brakes hit. And I mean, like you heard crashing outside. <laughs> right, right here in the studio. I, I mean, that was, that was rough. I actually, for the people who don't know, one of the things that I try to do if you're new to the show is I do a little bit something different on each and every intro where I use an, a different alliteration when introducing baby cakes. And it's something that I started kind of at the first couple of shows that we did. And I've just kind of kept doing it. And people have mentioned it to me um, from time to time. Um, and now that we are actually in our second year of doing the rumble season two, this is season two, episode one. It's kind of crazy. I'm pretty excited about it. Oh no, this is episode two. Season. It'll actually be episode two yeah. because, uh, I mean, you know, we took a little bit of a break, um, for the holiday, for the holiday and just trying to get everything together. And we had, we just had like multiple, Christmas locations that we have to be at. Do you have to do that too, Jess? Do y'all have multiple places that you have to be, or do y'all just basically, you know, yes. gather the chickens and and uh, <laughs> no, and just celebrate? We, and I, I mean, like you probably create your own nativity scene out there in the in the country. What we did actually several years ago was we had this lofty idea, and we bought a timeshare up in the Ozark Mountains, um, basically right outside of Branson. And it's Big Cedar Lodge, so it's part of that whole, you know, Blue Green Resorts or whatever, Big, you know, Big Cedar Lodge. It's up in the mountains. It's drop-dead gorgeous. It's beautiful. And they deck everything out for Christmas. Like, uh, it's several hundred acres that they deck out for the holidays. And they have all kinds of stuff for kids, activities, you know, little elves will come to your you know, your, your law, your lodge or to your cabin and tuck in your little kids. There's, it's just a magical place to be and it's outdoorsy. Sure. So everybody wins, right? We thought, man, if we just bought this, then we wouldn't have to have six different trips to different families. We'll bring everybody here and we'll be able to house everybody. Cause at a minimum we can house 16 people up there once a year. And so we jumped, we did all of that. <laughs> we used it for the first time this year and we purchased it back in 2014. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so nine well, years later, we finally get the family up there and everybody goes, Oh my God, this is amazing. So we're hoping maybe over time we'll actually get to just make one or two trips instead of, you know, 30. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nine years later, here we are. But uh, <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to use that um, at this point in time next year for fun facts with baby cakes. You know, it's like how long did you know it actually took nine years for for the Odells to actually celebrate <laughs> Christmas? It was really quite quite interesting. In the time um, <laughs> we'll add that to the baby uh, to the fun facts with baby cakes. But speaking of fun facts with baby cakes, I have some fun facts. Do you have some fun facts? And I by do. the way, I, I just had a curiosity. Who helps us out with fun facts? Who steps up and helps us make sure that we have fun facts? Me. Just you, <laughs> and huh? Ink. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the best way to oh shoot. Well, that's what editing's for. I just want to make sure everybody messed up at some point to, not today. The best way to get paid during an insurance claim: ink, save time, get paid. Thank you, boys, for me. <laughs> and how about some fun facts there, baby cakes? Okay, did you know that the Vatican City is the smallest country in the world? I did know that. That I did know, that the Vatican City is actually considered a sovereign nation. Yep, it's 120 times smaller than Manhattan Island. 
I hadn't done the math, but I... I, I, I well, see, I, I took the time to... No, it's, actually written, it's written here on the interwebs. <laughs> nice. Um, Japan has over 200 flavors of Kit Kats. 200 flavors of Kit Kat? Mm-hmm. There's some that sound good. They're banana, blueberry, cheesecake, Oreo ice cream. There are also some questionable ones like baked potato, melon and cheese, wasabi, and vegetable juice. <laughs> so gross. Vegetable juice. Yep. That's what I want is a V8 flavored Kit Kat. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> Bacon. Can we get a bacon flavored Kit Kat? Yeah, I mean, as long as we're doing ridiculous stuff, how, how about a bacon or a dog biscuit flavored one? Well, they probably have it. There's 200 of them. Good grief. I like the one flavor we have. I don't know why you got to go messing with it. That I one's just know. fine. I mean, I think, don't they have a white chocolate one now? Well, yeah, but that's just for weirdos. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that, that should be the only one allowed. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think the reason we have white chocolate is for the weirdos that eat white chocolate. And if you're a weirdo that I eat, eat white, white cho- chocolate, I appreciate the people that eat white chocolate because they stay the hell away from my, my regular milk chocolate. I eat both. And I'll what? eat I'll, I'll, I eat both of them. <laughs> That's not okay. Why? <laughs> That's the only reason I think white chocolate exists is to stay I away from I will steal your candy. Man, golly. I'm just never safe anywhere I go. I can't do intros. My chocolate's not safe. I mean, today's really going downhill in it's a hurry. It's a bad day for you. Well. Um, <laughs> crocodiles can't stick out their tongue. That's why you've never seen a crocodile stick th- stick their tongue out. In case you were ever <laughs> wondering why. Crocodiles were cranky because they had all those teeth. All their teeth. No, it's their medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata. <laughs> 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 Um, pigs can't look up in the sky because the anatomy of their spine and neck muscles limits their movement and restricts their head from being able to look upward. Neither can Batman, evidently. <laughs> look up in the sky. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, now you know, and knowing is half the bullshit. Well, knowing is half the bullshit, guys. That is Fun Facts with Baby Cakes. Guys, if you have some fun facts that you want to make sure make the show, make sure that you drop them down in the comments. And Baby Cakes will vet them to make sure, first of all, that they are facts. And that we haven't done them before. And not just musings. You can't just have an opinion. It's actually got to be a fact. So if you've got some that you would want to make the show, please uh, yeah. reach out to Baby Cakes. And don't tell us we suck. Because that's not a fact. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it may be debatable, but it has not yet been determined to be a fact. Guys, we have got a great show coming up for you. We are going to be talking a little bit about the landscape of which lies ahead. There's a lot of things that we can look into. We're going to take a look back as the way things used to be. Some of the new challenges that we have experienced along the way and uh, what we think it's going to look like um, in the future moving forward with different policies and how carriers handle things. We're going to be coming to you in three separate rounds. When you hear this sound, you know that the round has begun. And when you hear this sound, you're going to know that the round is over. As always, this is a discussion. It's not a debate show because it is you that is in the rumble and we are merely sitting ringside commentating on the blow by blow action that you guys are in each and every day. I am looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be a good one. Let's get into round one because it starts right after this. Public adjusters, listen up. It's Jeremy Lavelle, owner of Remedy Claims Consulting, host of the Rumble, and most importantly, your claims coach. Public adjuster training is one of the hardest things to find. Sure, you can take some online seminars, you can show up to conferences, but none of them tailor training just for you until now. Whether you need to learn how to estimate, scope, negotiate, or prospect, I can help you drill down on the skills you want to develop. Maybe you're just starting out and you need to learn the claims process from a to Z, or you're just wanting help on strategy on a specific claim. I can help you find the traction you were looking for and learn how to truly control the narrative in the ever-changing world of claims. You can reach out to me directly at 888-596-8772, or you can find me on the web at 
at RemedyClaims.com and just click Get Started. That's 888-596-8772 or RemedyClaims.com and click Get Started. You can even shoot me an email at Jeremy at RemedyClaims.com. That's J-E-R-O-M-Y at RemedyClaims.com. It's time to move your career to the next level. Round one. What was it like before COVID? The glory days. Oh, the glory days. Oh, the glory days. I wax nostalgic of what it was like before COVID. Because I don't don't mean glory days as in like a monetary type glory. I mean glory days as at that time I felt like I was doing my job and could help somebody without having to get an attorney involved or go to appraisal or do these other alternate, you know, I, we didn't have to do that. It was so rare. In fact, I remember back then one of the indicators that we used to say, you know, in our little circle talks, right. One of the indicators of a bad PA was if you were sending 20% or more of your files to an attorney, because right. there was no need you, you were, everything was just, Oh man, it was glorious. It was amicable. It was common sense. And it was done. It was usually two claim professionals actually working things out on what the yes. actual loss was. And one of the things that I remember is that is that carriers and I mean, and while wild widely serviced by independent adjusting firms, they would actually send out real adjusters. And yep. it wasn't really until COVID came in that a lot of these third-party contractors, not that an independent adjusting firm isn't, but it was when they started using, you know, the ladder services and and they would not send out licensed personnel. I mean, I remember when I started as an independent adjuster, that was it was one of two things. Either I was writing for damages that I observed or I was writing for the policy based on the causation and the damages that were covered. And I did that as a, I mean, that, and it was quite, it was quite common that I would have to go out and, you know, you know, determine causation, determine the extent of the damage, look at the things, converse with contractors. And that was really, really common. And um, when COVID hit, like during COVID, they just quit sending people out. And I mean, part of that I get, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem when there is a pandemic or, you know, prior to us having vaccines available to us, if that's a direction that you want to go, I'm not here to weigh in on whether or not you should be vaccinated or not vaccinated, but as a frontline worker, do you know what I'm saying? And, and I, you know, I pretty much determined frontline workers, people that have to go out and expose themselves because when your roof caves in, there's no waiting on that. I mean, so some of us have to go out and we have to initiate the process regardless of the circumstances. And so as frontline workers, I understand that there are some qualifications and things that need to be done. But, you know, whether it's vaccinations or whatever, there was a lot of us before those were available, you know, a solid, um, you know, for some people waited, what, five months for a vaccination for their number to even come up to get a vaccination that we were out there working sort of without a safety net, so to speak. So either way, what I'm driving at here is that I understand that there was some of that, but once the vaccinations became widely available, they still determined they, they never really went back to sending out, you know, licensed adjuster. Now it's a crapshoot on who you get, whether or not they're licensed or not licensed. And I mean, and that's still the case is what I'm finding, you know, but before COVID, it was a good bet that at a bare minimum, you were going to get an independent adjuster that probably went through some sort of certification process to work those carriers' claims. Yeah. And and so you were typically, at least my situation or experience back before COVID, you had one or two adjusters at the most that you were dealing with. You simply had to go out, measure, chalk it up, If it was a roof, prepare a photo report, annotate your damages on the photo report, prepare an estimate, turn it all in, and you were done. That was it. it, Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe you had the same experience. Maybe not. Typically within the first 30 to 60 days, I could get 80% of that estimate approved and I might only be spending 30 days fighting the last 20%. That, That was kind of typical. It was maybe you're fighting the last 20%. 
and and then in the end, once you prepared your rebuttal, it got paid dollar for dollar, just about. Generally, yeah, I would agree. That was basically what happened. And, By and, and large, was that done. was that was the result that you got. Yep. And and I'm not talking about, you know, for for the roofing claims because I started mostly with you know small water losses and roof claims <clears throat> as a new PA. Um. I'm not talking about, you know, in our estimates, we were, you know, demanding full decking replacements or full, like all these other things, you know, that I'm starting to see in a lot of different PA estimates nowadays. Before then, it really was bare bones. This is bare bones, what the insured needs to get this roof replaced, or this is bare bones, what they need to get, you know, this water loss under control and then the rebuild done. I just... I haven't seen that after COVID. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it is, I, I mean, since COVID, basically kind of once we, you know, as a country sort of figured out how to manage COVID, okay? And that's what I mean. I'm not talking about eradicated. I'm not talking about all of that kind of stuff. I'm right. talking about how we managed the outbreak, and continue to manage the outbreak of COVID-19 and however many different strains there are right now. It went, they, they, they tended to hide behind. I mean, how do I want to put this? They hid behind the veil of, we can't really, they realized that some of this worked and it kind of helped them. It suited them not to be able to send people out and they would argue and we can't really get there. And they realized that a lot of people still just kind of gave up and said, this is what the insurance carrier approved. They can't get out here because of COVID. And so this is what we have to live with. And, you know, and, and basically the numbers held true that so many claims went unrepresented. Nobody was actually holding the carrier to it. And so their guidelines for lack of a better term got even more restrictive than they were before because they learned that people as a general rule, the unrepresented is really more what I'm referring to, would accept even less than what they were doing. And I'll just give you an example. There is a large carrier, large nationwide carrier that you see commercials on. You know, if you have damage to a wall in a room, for example, Generally, the guideline that I learned as an independent adjuster that most of you contractors know, public adjusters, if you have you paint one wall, you're painting all the walls, maybe not the ceiling, but you at least were painting all right. of the walls at a bare minimum one coat. Well, now this carrier yep. has maintained this guideline where they'll only paint the damaged wall and that's yep. it. And and those are things that's one specific one. And I know that seems like a small thing. I, you know what I'm saying? I know it kind of seems like a small thing, but that's that's I'm seeing more and more guidelines like that. And it was during COVID when they were sending out people who weren't licensed adjusters to basically make determinations. They would just go, we want you to document damage and only damage. We don't want to give you any recommendation for repair. All we want to do is tell us, tell me how many shingles are damaged. And that's what they would do. And then it would get to the desk adjuster and they were writing single shingle repairs. Yep. And that is a lot of what I saw. And and Jess, would you agree that that's kind of when I started seeing the individual shingle repair thing, you know, through a lot of the major carriers? Yeah. And there's actually, there's a really cool chart that Elliott Claim Services, so big shout out to Britt and Sahar Elliott and Rob McCready, Kane Seymour out of Texas. They posted on their page uh, just yesterday or the day before um, a chart. And it's a timeline and it was this perfect timing for this post, but it's, it was put together by the Florida association of public insurance adjusters. And it's a timeline that goes from 1992 to 2020. And it's called a shrinkflation. Basically as your premiums go up, your coverages go down. And in this day, it's just really cool. So 1992 was the first time hurricane deductibles appeared. Okay, that's kind of reasonable, right? I mean, some of these are kind of reasonable. You're like, okay. Okay, 1998, the collapse coverage was drastically reduced. I can't speak to that. I'm not 100% sure what what occurred there. Mold exclusion showed up in the year 2000. So we'll table that because it got worse in 2020. In yeah. 2004, the percentage of deductibles started to appear for other perils. 
So you started seeing one deductible for one peril and another completely different deductible for things like hurricanes or whatever. Yeah, po- yeah, as opposed to du- I saw hurricane deductibles in Irma. I will say that. I did I did see hurricane deductibles in Irma. In 2006, fence awning and screen enclosures started to become excluded unless otherwise stated or maybe they brought it back, but in 2006 it started being excluded. So again, premiums continue to go up, but now all of a sudden fences, awnings, screen enclosures are being excluded. 2008 mandatory managed repair programs. Ooh. Okay. Ugh. Just I just I'll, I'll t- share my experience with that. Before I came became a public adjuster, I had a water loss. And I went through USAA, you know, that's who I had. So that's that's what I can speak to. Um they had a managed you know repair program type thing where you're per- it was actually more like preferred vendor. That's what it really is. Just a preferred vendor. I didn't know any better. I said, yeah, my insurance company's going to take care of me. They're going to pick pick the vendor and they're going to pay the vendor. I don't have to do anything. They're just going to take care of it all for me. It was horrible. Lowest bidder could fail. No communication. I would constantly communicate with them. The workmanship was awful. Trying to get a hold of them to come back and fix things was awful. But they got their money. They got their money from the insurance company. They didn't care. It was a horrible experience. So now I can yeah. say and can speak to what it's like to be a homeowner who has gone through a preferred vendor situation. Man, Um, I have never really. And one of the things that for those of you who don't know me all that well, those of you who do know that I'm an avid networker. I, one of the things that I really love to do is, is I love my networking group. And if you're interested about a networking group, let me know, but that's not the point of this, me inserting this. But I work, I, because I network, I have the opportunity to meet a lot of different contractors. And there's a ton of contractors out there that work in what are these preferred contracting networks. Now, understand, it's not like the, the you know, they pr- approach carriers. There's a middleman. There's a third-party administrator between these contractors and the carrier. And the carrier negotiates with the third-party administrator who then... Um, contractors apply to to be a part of that network and it's a great way to get you know to start really building your business and to scale your business um but the and i actually worked for a contractor at one point in time that was involved in many of those in fact they brought me in for my insurance experience and how i understood how those guidelines worked and all of that kind of stuff and that's really one of the very first places where i dipped my toe in the waters on this side of the fence, so to speak. And it had, it over time really began to degrade as those third party administrators started agreeing with the carrier on, okay, yeah, we'll just paint one wall or, okay, um, you know, we'll never, we'll, we'll agree. They'll have water mitigation companies agree to never tear out carpet. I mean, are you aware of some of this, Jess? Like even on the water loss side of things, they, they agreed to never tear out carpet or never pull up floors in any kind of way, especially if there was a slab underneath them that they could always be cleaned. It was, you know, mitigation was, was, was beginning to degrade at a very steady rate. And when, and when COVID hit, I mean, it got, you know, a lot worse, you know what I'm saying? And so I don't want to get into round two too quickly here, but I mean, that's one of the things that I noticed is that you started to see even a decline before COVID, but in COVID, you know, you know what I'm saying? So yes, it, according to this chart, it started in 2016. In 2016, exclusions and managed repair profile or programs, you know, started becoming more and more pre- prevalent, and they included things like flooring exclusions. And this is the yep. one that hit me: was like, what? It's limits on emergency services and mitigation. They started limiting. I just saw that in a policy. That that just showed up in a policy that I looked yes. at just the other day. $3,000, Jess. $3,000 on emergency services on water mitigation. Yep. So, and, so that, that's those, all of those. That, those were the, that was the the steady premiums are going up, but exclusions are becoming more and more. That was the steady flow. Again, I didn't put this together. I I can't vet all of the information on it, but Florida association of public insurance adjusters is a pretty reputable association. So Uh, somebody did the the appy is out there. I look at them quite a bit Yeah, of the appy is that exist out there. And then 2020 hits 
which will lead us into the next round. But 2020 is, hits, and we really start seeing. Man, and and I just, I, I, I mean, it was sort of like as a preferred contractor prior to COVID, it was just about anything that we recommended. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like even because yep. there were certain situations where we were part of the preferred network, the adjuster had come out, and one of my main jobs within that with with within that organization that I was working with was to write the supplements for all the things that the adjuster had missed had missed and that was that was my job is basically to go in okay so this adjuster missed you know ice and water in the valley so to speak okay just as an example they missed all of the code stuff which was pretty common so i would go in and i would add all of the code stuff i would um i would figure out you know whether or not they had the code upgrade coverage and all of these additional things that were there and i would write those standard supplements but then i would see you know, they would leave things off. Um, gosh, it's kind of hard to explain. I, it's hard for me to get a get an idea here of exactly what I'm talking. Oh, here's a really good example. Um, like on a chimney, if you had like the flu cap, flu cap um, the chase cover that was damaged, which is commonly what you see is the chase cover will be damaged by hail, especially in Texas. You'll see the chase cover that's damaged. Well, sometimes that chase cover has a that chase cover is typically riveted in some kind of way to the flu cap and spark arrestor. OK, so you can't just detach and reset the flu cap and spark arrestor off of the chase cover. It's riveted together. And that one of the mo most common things that I would see is they would not include that line item. It's just little things. Um, if they had to replace a window for some reason, they would never add like a like a retro, uh, you know, a retrofit charge, basically, because, you know, windows are kind of built when the ha windows are inserted when the house is framed. And when you're trying to, after brick is installed and all of the stuff is done, there is a retrofit charge. And actually, when you replace a window, it's smaller than the original window that was yes. in there. And so um, there's a retrofit charge. There's um, this uh, insulation that, well, it's like this foam that you have to spray in the gaps to make sure that the window is pro properly insulated and sealed up and all kinds of things like that. And they would commonly leave that off. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot working with that contractor because it certainly affected the way that I estimated. That's where I, I mean, that's where I really started stretching my estimate muscles where it was working in those situations and learning how to supplement. And that, that was stuff that was just breezing by breezing by in that situation that has since really become different. And we're going to talk about what it's like now now that COVID has hit, and even though that COVID is basically for all practical purposes come and gone, or at least we've learned how to manage it, what is it like now? We're going to talk about that in round two. And round two starts right after this. One of the most difficult claims you can work is a contents claim. It requires extreme detail and significant documentation. Ricky McGregor with Monarch Claim Services is the expert you need on your side. She will handle on-site evaluation, inventory, photo documentation, pricing, and overall contents claim organization. She will work with your team beginning to end so you can focus on the rest of the claim. Do your client a favor and call Ricky McGregor with Monarch Claim Services. You can reach her at 515-783-1434. That's 515-783-1434 or find her on the web at monarchclaimservices.com. Round two, what's it been like after COVID? So I think we all, <laughs> I, about the time I feel like I'm done spitting teeth out of my mouth from them getting kicked in um, <laughs> and get the, get the tears out of my eyes from being punched in the nose. I, I get hit with something new and something different. Is that kind of, and I know Jesse, you're working for a contractor now, but even as a public adjuster and a contractor, I mean, you still run into the same stuff, right? Yes. I mean, it's not, it's not any different really. Yeah. I mean, cause the job is different. The job's not really any different. The skill set's the same. You're doing the same stuff. So tell me a little bit about kind of what you're running into. Okay. So I'll caveat this or, or just go ahead and preface this with, I've worked for several different firms 
over the four years that I had been a full-time public adjuster. Okay. Four different firms. Part of that was to rule out that a specific firm or this firm or that firm, the, you know, it, that the reason claims weren't getting paid, right. Is because maybe the firm I was working for was really was doubling or tripling estimates and inflating. And maybe it really was that the, the final decision makers may have been making it difficult to get claims paid. So I test waters in the next one and, you know, working hurricane claims and being a surge inspector or a surge desk adjuster, you know, public adjuster, you know, in working whatever capacity I could work for, you know, a firm that needed somebody to help work that hurricane. I got to see how different firms operated. And what I started to see was that it didn't matter how amazing or how crappy you were as a public adjuster or that firm was, whoever, it didn't matter. Claims were not getting paid. And I'll have to say in the South, I can't speak for the Northern States, but along the Gulf States, we all started feeling it. And I think now, now it has definitely made its way up to some of the Northern States because now I hear PAs in the North complaining about what we started complaining about back in 2020. So what we saw in 2020, typically all of a sudden you're now dealing with three to five adjusters, even on just a simple roof claim, three to five adjusters. Now you're having to go not just one level up to a supervisor, but the supervisor above that is now required. At, at least as of this year, I started seeing that a lot. Now you have to go two levels up and then you finally get to somebody that's like, oh yeah, I see what they did. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get them trained and I apologize. Yeah. We'll pay it. Blah, blah, blah. Or whatever. Now we're seeing, you know, I'm filing so many more TDI complaints than ever before, you know, and, and before, you know, we kind of talked about this it used to be, all you had to do was take your measurements, chalk it up, prepare the report, prepare the estimate and you're done. Now you have to do those things. Plus you're including a hail trace or a hail strike report so that you can go ahead and show them the data about the size of hail and the intensity that hit at that address. Then you're including maybe some other weather reports. Now we're having to include exactimate overhead and profit white papers. Now we're having to get scientific, you know, engineer relating publications in there to rebut some simple, very simple roof, you know, proper methods, means of repair type conversations. Like, very simple. Um, and then where it used to take maybe 30 or 60 days to get 80% on the first try, and you're maybe spending 30 more days to get the last 20, eventually you get your full dollar amount. I started seeing, you may, after three or four months, you might see 30 or 4% of it paid. You know, before, before COVID, it was like one thing, and then it's been like this complete completely different profession it's like because I, I you know little things like being able to negotiate was one thing that we had you know that it's like you could actually get an adjuster on the other on the other line and 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 go through well the policy says this and says this and you could actually negotiating actually worked and and it seemed like after covid when they started sending out you know basically unlicensed unlicensed professionals you know what I'm saying? And and I don't want to just say that they're not, that they don't know what they're doing. Cause I don't think that that's fair. Do you know what I'm saying? I think that they were sent out with a different set of instructions than what inspectors were sent out with before. And I think that they had a much more narrow uh, scope of, of inspection is what it was like before. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it really, yeah, well, definitely no authority. Definitely I mean, no I'm not even sure they were allowed no, they to use the, no the, the camera that they were taking pictures with. You know what I'm saying? It's like it, it was it was so different right. and so contentious. And, you know, and then you notice I noticed the guidelines uh, began to stiffen. And 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 most of it was pretty much inconsequential because I can get around guidelines, not and not even trying to convince them that their guidelines are wrong. I just get around it with the fact that the language of the policy says that we will we reserve the right to repair or replace, but we will pay the lesser of these amounts. And it wasn't hard to prove that this was this is what it took to get the job done. Indemnity was still the bar to be cleared. And so that was a fairly easy thing to get around. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, yes. while I've learned how to maneuver and adapt to sort of that sort of obtuse approach to claims handling, 
it is still, I mean, it, you know, I feel like I'm still spitting my teeth out. You know, about the time I think I'm done, I get kicked with something brand new. You know what I'm saying, Jess? Yeah. And I'll, what I did when I was full time PA, because I did it for four years full time. That's all I did was, was adjust claims. I, I was more hurricanes right? So I was surge, like a surge desk adjuster, or I would pick up and help out with inspections, documenting losses, what have you. So I got to see multiple firms and how they operated. And what all that did was confirm for me, it did not matter if you were a phenomenal public adjuster. And if your file was ironclad, or if your file was junk, the carriers weren't paying anything now when i say anything i mean they might okay yeah 10 percent of what you wrote okay yeah here's a small check or or right. or a lot of these oh uh, well it just didn't meet you know it's still under deductible but you know we tried you know that kind of stuff and and but again it was, we didn't change the profession of public adjusting didn't change and we saw this happening overnight before you could maybe spend 30, 60 days and you'd get 80% of the claim paid almost right away, right? Sure. During the, the 30, 60 days. And then you might spend another 30 days fighting for 20%. Yeah. And when I say but fighting, what I mean, was you know, going on during this time? Homeowners weren't upset. You were able to at least commence yeah. with work and get most of it done. Yes. And then you kind of fought it on the back end, right? But now it's, I mean, public adjusters everywhere. And at first it was, I noticed it a lot just in the Gulf states. I, 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 there was a lot of PAs in the Northern States that just weren't seeing or weren't understanding what I meant when I was saying, you know, claims aren't getting paid, claims aren't getting paid. Now they're starting to say the same things. So at first, I think it just kind of started in the Gulf States. And it makes sense it would have because even during COVID, when the stock market tanked, right, what is what does insurance do? They reinvest in the stock market, they keep, you know, reinvesting. So the further they can delay or not pay, that's more time to reinvest. And when the stock market's as low as it was, and we get hit by Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Delta, Hurricane Zeta, then Hurricane Ida, <laughs> and then Ian, of course, you know, it, it. we were going to see this in the southern states. Now it's moving into the northern states. Now it feels like we are fighting for three, four, five months to get maybe 20 to 30 percent 40 at the most paid for and then we're having to do rebuttals comparative analysis or discrepancy reports whichever you want to call them final demands where where, where it used to be our proof of loss package was was generally a really good photo report measurements and an estimate now yep. we're having to include you know hail trace or hail strike reports other weather reports exactimate overhead and profit white papers you know Hague certifications, other scientific publications put out by like the American Society of Civil Engineering. I mean, we are having to go crazy above and beyond to prove how asinine, you know, some of these refusals to pay, you know, these reasons for rejecting proof of loss. We're having to go above and beyond and way outside the scope of what a public adjuster is supposed to even be. Yeah, because we're not really supposed to provide anything other than what the homeowner would be required to provide in order to get the claim covered, right? You know what I'm saying? And and you bring up all of these different, you know, experts and and I forgot the I forgot the terminology you used there, but I really I, I do recall really liking it. But like all of these different sort of authorities that are out there to prove something they already know is true. Yes. And that was really the thing. It's like, you know, what I'm showing you with a picture is accurate, true, and, 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 and payable based on what I'm showing you, you know, that the, what this is and, but I'm having to go to Hague. I'm having to go to, you know, the American society of engineers. I'm having to go to all of these different, I'm having to go to all of these different third party sources to basically prove to you that I know, and it was really like saying, like, I've done my homework and I know and you don't have any sort of plot. I mean, I'm having to remove all plausible deniability because really and truly when claims get adjusted by the carrier, 
sort of the code of ethics there is to have an eye towards coverage. You're supposed to go out and basically seek out coverage in the policy to extend coverage. And that's what it was really like. I mean, I would even say as early as 10 years ago. Now, guys that have been that have been, you know, swinging this hammer a lot longer than I have or a lot longer than Jess has. Um, you know, will tell you that they have seen a basically a steady decline since the McKinsey report came out. And I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm not one to really try, try to even refute sort of some of the things that your Tony Ruguses would tell you and your Jack Hanks and your Steve Patrick's that have been around, you know, for, you know, 30 plus decades, guys that work the collapse at Jericho, those guys, I'm not really trying to um, you know, you know, refute kind of what they've seen, you know, over over their much longer history than mine. But there was a line, a very clear line of demarcation on what was required to prove a loss. And I mean, and it's like even in my and I'm and I'm telling you, like I have spoken with carriers at a very very intelligent level, you know, I'm talking with, with high level management because I, I escalated it to that point. And I could, and if somebody asked me, it's like, well, how did you get, you know, you know, high level management in this claim, even on the phone, it's like, look, man, I don't know. I don't think I could ever do it again. Um, and it's basically when, and I'm talking about dealing with high level adjusters too, like, you know, three decade plus veteran adjusters that work for these national carriers that, I mean, we would go at it. And I think the only reason that I got to speak with management is there was a level of knowing that I knew what I was talking about, sure. but they knew that they couldn't approve it. And I said, well, can I talk to whoever your, you know, your, your, your team lead is here and let me get them on the phone. And, and that's how I did it. And I'm going to tell you yep. one of them while I did not get everything I fought for, I still got a six figure return from that conversation that I would not have ordinarily gotten, you know, yeah. and, and that's not me kind of, you know, tooting my own horn here over, you know, what I can make carriers do and not do. But the burden of proof uh, is, is so far outside of what the policy requires within their parameters of a proof of loss. And I'm not talking about the form. It's the burden of proof that exists on the shoulders of the of the of the policyholder to submit what they have to submit in order to get that loss paid because the burden of proof is on us as public right. adjusters, as the policyholders, the burden of proof of the loss is on you. And I am not even mad at the carrier for running out and attempting to to keep in control of the narrative by having their adjuster show up 24 hours after you file the claim so that they can get a, they can get it paid. Because people's perspective is not whether or not the claim gets paid accurately as much as their idea of a good insurance company is if it gets paid quickly, even if it's underpaid. It's like, oh, they came out and they cut me a check right away. I have the greatest insurance company in the world. Well, do, I mean, does it bother you that they shorted you $40,000? Because they don't know. Right. They just don't know. And so people's perspective, and, and they're blissfully ignorant and, and it's like, well, this is all the insurance covers, you know, and any contractor that knocks on their door says, this is not enough money. The perspective of somebody who responded quickly gets all of the trust. And the person who says this isn't enough money just comes off as greedy. Yep. Yeah. You know, and, and there's a stigma be, there. It seemed like before COVID, you may have one to two adjusters you were working with ever on a, on a particular claim. One, maybe two at the most. It seemed like after COVID, you and you kind of touched base on it in the previous um, in the previous round. Now we have all these third parties, um, or we still have field adjusters with no check writing authority, no anything. They're just specifically sent out to photograph, take some notes, and turn it into a desk adjuster. What I have found is even on a standard or or easy roof claim you still could have three to five adjusters that you're dealing with in total by the time that thing gets settled. And then instead of just maybe one supervisor, I'm finding now, especially with two of the bigger or biggest nationwide carriers, I'm having to go two levels above the sure. desk adjuster. Yeah. And then it's like that, that third level up goes, man, you know, you're right. I didn't realize this is what the adjust. Yeah, you did. You know, it, you know, plausible deniability, 
only goes so far. Like, it, and TDI complaints. I can't. Rem- I don't hardly remember filing any TDI complaints before COVID. Well, and and I don't file many of them now, unless it's a clear behavioral violation. Like you're not calling me back. And it's like, I wouldn't have to file complaint. Look, because I realize that they typically are not going to get in most, at least the Texas Department of Insurance is not going to insert themselves when I think the loss is $40,000 and they think the loss is $20,000. They're just not going to insert themselves there. They're just not. That's not their charter. charter I mean, it's not, and it's a waste of their time to ask them to do that. You know what I'm saying? And so I, 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 and so I'm very careful with the complaints I file. I file complaint when, when I appear to be up against an unethical culture, so to speak. And, and, and I think one of the things that I really think that has been very prevalent basically since COVID has occurred and because of the kind of people that they're sending out, because of some of the things that we're, we're up against that we're seeing is you have seen an explosion and the explosion has then turned into a weapon a weaponizing of the appraisal process. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even carriers are guilty of this, too. They'll go through a bastardized version of appraisal process called we're going to send out an engineer. Yes. (laughs) Yes, sir. Get your ass out there and adjust the damn claim. You know what I mean? It's like, well, we're going to send an engineer out because we're afraid if we go out there and look at you, we can't argue against you. So we're going to get somebody that can't argue against you either, but has a college degree. And we have reason to stand up in court and go, well, we hired an expert. Uh It's not that they think they're right. It's not that they that you haven't won your argument. It's that they have attained obtained some sort of legitimate, plausible deniability to say no. It doesn't have anything to do with being right. I wish I wish all we had to do, Jess, was be right. Because if all we had to do was be right, you and I would have a lot more money. And so would our insurance. Well, I, without enough. having to get an attorney involved. Well, yeah, without. and the number of the number of cases that are being litigated now because carriers are just you know daring us to sue them, you know, and. Yeah. Kudos to you homeowners out there. And I think a lot of this, because one of the one of the m- biggest, most major catastrophes that we saw, and I'm not going to take anything away from Laura, but this catastrophe certainly affected way more homeowners than Laura did. And that was, you know, Winter Storm Uri when it basically hit, you know, most of the South. And I know, I know Texas was crippled by it much more than a lot of the other states, but I don't want to take it away from them. But that's when you really started to see a ton of low payouts. And, you know, a lot of North Texas got very educated on the claims process. And just to just to kind of tie that in a bow there, if you don't mind, that is, I mean, that was one of those things that happened as from a from a nationwide catastrophe that got national attention much like a hurricane would if you're tracking with me right was when they started limiting what they were going to pay i mean i worked a claim i worked one of those claims jess and can you imagine how many available water mitigation contractors there were three weeks after that happened and you know you've got you've got structures sitting there i mean not just soaking wet but was a you know a giant science project if you know what i'm saying incredible the the photographs the videos all the way down to galveston the freaking coast and the boats were covered in ice i mean it It was nuts and and then when when they're sitting there wet due to the breaks due to the runoff the flooding that happened just because everything began to melt and break loose and all of that that was happening and then you have a carrier have the audacity or one of their adjusters who understands the ICRC you know they go well look you've got a you've got a 20 by 15 room and it says that you just need a medium dehumidifier and you know four fans and you used four extra large fans and you did you used an extra large dehumidifier so you're using oversized equipment all we can pay for is like look no 
we didn't use oversized equipment. We used available equipment because that was the challenge. And they were wanting to underpay some of these mitigation costs that look, we, I mean, this is what this costs and this is what was available. And, you know, we've, we've done all of the drying logs. We've done everything that you've asked for all of the moisture mapping. And it was the oversized equipment that was available. Or I put 14 undersized pieces of equipment in there when it only took, you know, eight. And I put, and it's like, you have too many in there and you use this. And it's like, look, I wasn't using the wrong size. And I mean, even the IICRC talks about ideal situations, you know, and it's, and it's like, if it's this is what we have to work with but the but um you know th- this was about what was available in an unprecedented event go ahead i can tell you got something you want to wrap this up with so, so the iacrc's s500 that's the water restoration technician manual is currently undergoing a rewrite i am on the board for that rewrite and we have been working arduously through fine tooth combing it you know, since uh, about July, we meet once a week and then there's subcommittees that's based upon certain recommendations. Like somebody would recommend we change something. A subcommittee would be put together to tackle that recommendation and come up with a final consensus. And then it would go to the whole board. So twice a week, I've been involved in this thing since July. And we, we constantly remind ourselves that what we put into that manual is under best conditions, but we are ensuring that the language leaves room for that technician, that professional to make judgment calls based on their situation and the environment they're operating in all the variables at play, you know? So it, it's not, and, and the carriers somehow, took some language that there is a standard three day drying period and had been running with that for several years. And that we, we nipped that in the bud and that'll be coming out, you know, in, in the final whatever. But we said nowhere in here, does it say that the standard is three days? It says that the technician (laughs) should (laughs) use discretion and use readings, moisture readings to make sure to take whatever it takes to reach the baseline. Speaking of that, which lies ahead along with the new S 500 that is going to be coming out, we're going to get into all of these things as we see it coming from different standards and even some policy language, which I think we'll probably, you know, build a campfire around and forward our mail to um, in round three, because it starts right after this. When choosing someone to help with your online marketing, make sure you go with someone that has years of experience. Our good friend Sally at Thrive has over 20 years of digital marketing experience. She can build you a beautiful 15-page sleek, interactive website, post on your social media platforms multiple times a week. She can do a video, an amazing CRM to manage and uh, maintain and nurture your clients, text, email marketing, review generation, a business listing on 60 plus search engines, including three voice networks, appointment scheduling, estimates, invoices, payment processing, and more. She will also create for you on uh, on Google, a Facebook page, and Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you need these for your businesses, she'll, cr- she'll help you create those pages on all of those sites. If you already have these pages, she'll optimize them for you as well. Well, call or message Sally today. If you want to get started, you can reach her at 214-789-1651. Again, her name is Sally Brigance. Her number is 214-789-1651. And uh, you'll also get a landing page the day you sign up. When you send her a referral that signs up with her, she'll credit your billing account. Logos are also available. Um, and she also offers a lead generation service to SEO search engine optimization where she can uh, guarantee you to appear on the first page of Google or your money back. It is spelled T H R Y B. And you can find my good friend Sally Brigance, and that's spelled S A L L I E Brigance, B R I G A N C E. And she can be reached once again at 214 789 1651. 
Round three. What can we look forward to? So what? Going back to that graphic that I that. Hang on, just a second, just a second. I don't want to cut you off. I don't want to cut you off, but I do want to address the three-day thing just really quickly that we wrapped round two up with. (laughs) The three, believe it or not, this is where this came from, and I just kind of want to, so so that you guys are armed with the information because yeah, the three-day thing that these carriers have run with for so long was actually a promotional period that was concocted by paul davis which is a very popular franchised franchised water mitigation or restoration company that basically said hey mr carrier i tell you what we'll dry any structure in three days or less and if it takes us longer we'll still only charge you for three days and as that and it was just a promotion in order to get carriers on their side so the carriers would refer them to do this work right and so it went from a promotion to you know because it became so popular to basically what whittled down to a guideline and a standard in their mind i don't think the s500 ever said that a structure would only take three days you know what i mean and they're and and they're sitting there telling you that it only takes three days to dry a structure and it's like but they won't listen to if a structure with a with with an initial cat one water loss and in three days it turns into a cat three because it just sat stagnant they don't want to look at that part of the standard they don't want to look at what happens in those three days but if we want to look at what can be done in three days that's the thing that they want to that's the thing that they want to you know you know, go to seed on. But anyway, that's the three day thing that I just wanted to throw out there, but you can follow that up if you want to. Yeah. And, and they don't take into account that, you know, some of these, some of these surf pros out there and the bell fours and the, this is and the, that's what they don't tell you is, okay, yeah, maybe they can dry it in three days, but they're going to put 20, 30, 40 pieces of equipment in there. Yeah, well, that's the, the smaller the, guys yeah. may not have all of the equipment, but are still properly drying out the structure over several days you know what i mean right (laughs) there is no three-day standard but yeah yeah because (laughs) it's just fun i didn't i forgot that i just wonder how wet something we don't have any idea what's in there can be (laughs) you know what i'm saying (laughs) going back to the graphic what came out in covid according to this graphic Uh uh-huh put again put out by by fapia florida association of public insurance adjusters 2020 and beyond is when we started seeing roof actual cash value charts, right? Those, mm-hmm. uh, what do they call them? RFSs? Yep. Um, or something like that, along those lines. Basically saying, okay, the rest of your house is still RCV, but if your roof gets damaged by hail and it's only like six years old, but it's rated to be, you know, 30 year then we're going to depreciate you know and and you're never going to get that so essentially your roof becomes an actual cash value well actually the peril of hail becomes an actual cash value peril is what's hysterical about that's essentially what they're saying is that if you get hit by this one peril while the rest of your house is rcv the only Mm -hmm. thing that would be this is an acv peril as it pertains to your roofing surface that's what they're essentially saying. And if you have metal, then it's not covered at all. So that's uh, what's next. The, the next bullet go ahead. says cosmetic exclusions. All of a sudden, cosmetic exclusions popped up. And look, I'll side with the carrier all day long. If it's like the sidewall is a metal sheet and maybe it got dinged up by some, okay, maybe it still sheds water. There's no hole. It still keeps the elements out. Okay, maybe. Maybe. But a roof that has clear indentations, if you take a bottled water, uh, I do a bottle, a water bottle test. I take the bottle of water up there and I pour it onto the roof and it goes, you know, around the little dents and it puddles and it sits. And then you start seeing mud in there and you see microbial growth in there, green stuff, orange stuff. It, and then eventually what happens? Rust. Well, of course, then they're not going to cover rust at that point because... It's rest. They don't, you know. Yeah, and so, it's long. It, it's long term damage. I will argue all day long if I can pour water on this roof, and the water completely sheds off like it's supposed to, then then I'll I'll side with you, Mister Carrier. I will. But if if it doesn't, 
and it is not performing its duty, which is to shed water, then it is functional damage all day long. The next one that came out was flooring so, um, exclusions and tear okay. out exclusions. And then I started seeing like in Mississippi, um, their, their water and, and it's a big red, big red policy. They're starting to exclude anything like, uh, dripping, leaking, um, I can't remember all the words that they were using in this policy, anything and everything to do with water, except a full blown pipe burst that covered the big old full blown pipe burst, but any other, anything to do with water, they're trying to misinterpret and say, it's not covered when, when that, with that language, and I've cleared it with many attorneys, that language was supposed to to catch the folks that really and truly knew that a leak was there they saw the dripping or they saw the the you know a little bit of saturation here and they ignored it that's what that language was supposed to address if it is inside of a wall cavity and it has been dripping and it is reasonable to expect nobody would have ever seen it until it became a problem that's i'm sorry that is not that is misrepresenting the policy if you deny a claim using that language well and, and here and, and just to kind of add on top of this because i've actually dealt with i've actually dealt with some of this and most recently i dealt with a denial that i lost and so yes i do lose um i mean losing 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 battles is part of it you know what i'm saying so right. all of you public adjusters out there i i, I want to take sort of the weight of winning off of your shoulders your job is to prove the loss Okay, that's 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 really what your job yeah. is. Your goal is to get an increase, but your job is to prove the loss. And I proved the loss. I didn't have any problem proving the loss. What I had was um, there was some rotten siding that allowed some water intrusion to come into a house. And for whatever reason, that water intrusion would fl- flow down the exterior inside of the exterior wall. And then when it got to the bottom of that wall, it would migrate outward from the house. And there was no sort of... Nor, no sort of damage that was really evident that was visible and it didn't show anything and there was no obvious, you know, manifestation or degradation of what was going on there. Well, you know, as things happen, and I mean, carriers have to agree with this, there's lots of ground shifting in houses. And I guess the ground shifted and the water took a turn and it started to flow inside and the manifestation of the damage moved inward. And it damaged some fairly new hardwood floors. And it went, and they basically said, well, um, when they first came out and looked at the loss, they basically denied it due to poor workmanship. And and Jess, I'm talking, they, the, you had entire planks that were bowing upward Tenting. like this. Yep. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they, they, they were yep. going all the way up and you can't see you guys driving in your car right now. Can't see me or, <laughs> but Jess can it's see tempting. me. And so it was like that. flat ones. They would take just about a, a 70 degree. They were bowing up 70 degrees. Okay. Um, I mean, we're talking a full on trip hazard here. I'm not talking about cupping. I'm talking about, and they were calling this poor installation. And it's like, look, I've seen poor installation of wood floors. I get what you're saying there, but you you don't see it pushed up to 70 degrees. And and it was um and and then once I kind of read said, look, and then they had American leak detection come out and they wrote it's like, no, this is because water intrusion came in the house. They changed their entire denial reason from from poor installation to um, long-term leaking. And I'm like, it's not long-term. The damage that it's done, the damage that we're claiming is not the damage inside the wall. That would be long-term. This isn't long-term. They still deny the claim. I'm still fighting the claim. I'll keep you posted on what happens, but that is the kind of thing that, that you see that they're misinterpreting the policy. So I want to give you guys a little bit of a tip here. Um, if I can insert something real quick, Jess, if you've got an insurance broker, if, if you're dealing with if you're dealing with one of the larger carriers that that deal with captive agents, so like your state farms and your farmers, a lot of times that insured will have a relationship with that agent that is most likely on their side, believe it or not. Right. What Agreed. you can do is go to that agent, and if they're not a captive agent, you can go to the broker. And this is even 
even comes off more innocuous, basically go write down the actual loss from an anecdotal standpoint. If this happened, hypothetically, would this part of the policy cover it, or is there a part of, of the policy that would cover this? And you have them send it into underwriting, have the agent send it into underwriting to determine whether or not that coverage is available and get what's called an underwriting review or a legal rendering on the policy from underwriting. And then you have it in your hot little hand what underwriting thinks about it. Because I can tell you two departments at an insurance company that do not talk to one another is underwriting and claims. And they have no idea what your claim history is. They have no idea what's going on 90% of the time. And if you and if you can navigate through an agent, and I have lots of friends that are brokers that I may have a, a customer that has a Liberty Mutual claim that that's not their agent. I'll go, hey, I'm just curious. This is the on this policy. Can you find out from them if they would cover this type of loss? And what would happen, you know, kind of what what underwriting says about it. So that's one of the things that you can do is you can go attack underwriting and and do it from a hypothetical or anecdotic uh, an a- anecdotic sort of perspective and see what underwriting says about it. Now, I'm not saying that'll help you win, but right. it certainly but makes it really more- difficult. I mean, that's what the policy covers. I mean, if you get underwriting says the policy covers this, then it's very difficult to defeat that. I'm not saying they won't do it. They'll figure out new ways to do it all the time. But that is and, that is one thing with, that you can do. I'm glad you said that because I do I see so much we're, we're talking about what we see coming, right? Yeah. I see so many more exclusions or caveats in here that are going to be misinterpreted and used against the insured. For example, especially when it comes to water losses in terms of seepage or leakage, there, there's, there's considering them one in the same and, and it's, and they're saying like, for example, I'll take the Mississippi example again. It's when the seepage or leakage is continuous, repeating, gradual, intermittent, slow, trickling, and is from heating, air conditioning, fire protective sprinkler system, household appliance, plumbing system. I mean, What? And all, all I can do is see more and more of this and the the roof ACV type policies, you know, especially in Hurricane Alley or not Hurricane Alley. I'm the sorry, first part uh, of that language that you read Alley. used to say over a period of weeks, months or years. Yeah, it doesn't say that in, in this. And now it's policy. over. Yeah, if it's if it's if it unless it's a sudden accidental escape of. Right. Water or steam necessarily, and I'm and I know I'm getting kind of policy languagey here, so forgive me. But um, yeah, you're seeing, and and one of the things that I've seen in a policy here recently is on the peril of hail. I mean, you guys think you had it bad when you had the the roofing the roofing schedule in there where they depreciated out over however many years based on the age and all this kind of stuff well hold on to your hats texas because i'm about to tell you something that you're going to start seeing a two percent of coverage a cap on the peril of hail when it comes to roofing services so no more schedule if your roof is damaged by hail and it's not leaking then you're going to get a you're going to see a two percent cap of coverage a so let me put that in perspective for you okay so if you've got a house that's got three hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of coverage on coverage a and that house gets hit by hail the max payout that you're going to get from an insurance carrier is seven thousand dollars on top of their two percent deductible yep so i mean it's they are i mean i am looking you are staring down the barrel of hail almost being an excluded peril when it comes to a roof. Um, You are going to see. And so basically what I think is going to happen and probably not over the next 12 months, obviously, but what you're going to see is um, for lack of a better term, surplus lines step in and you're going to start seeing roofs covered through endorsement. And you're just going to have to pay a high rate of endorsement on it based on, 
your exposed risk. I think that's one of the things that you're going to see. Uh, something that we mentioned, you know, that we we alluded to, and I can't remember it's going to make the recording, but I want to, it bears bringing it up. You're seeing caps. I'm seeing caps now, especially in Florida, on what used to be, you know, reasonable and necessary construction costs to mitigate from further damages. You're seeing a cap on yep. mitigation services and the one that i saw happened to be three thousand dollars and i don't expect it to get much north of that depending on the size of your policy you're looking at a three thousand dollar cap on mitigation services and i mean it is it is getting more and more difficult out there every single day and i you know i i anticipate because here's the thing guys and and this is my encouragement just just hang on a second cuz i know that you probably have some thoughts that you want to wrap up with evidently what we're doing is really working because it is getting to the point where we're either winning we're either winning on the roof you know standing on top of the roof or we're winning behind the desk we're offering documentation every every gauntlet they have laid down in front of us we have cleared with flying colors to the point that we're going all the way to the courthouse steps or in deposition and they're losing they're losing at every phase of the game and they are not playing complimentary fundamental football here because they are losing in every phase of the game and I know that a lot of us are still spitting out our teeth and coughing up blood here, but guys, what you're doing is working to the point that they're having to change the policy language, and that is truly their own defense, and at some point, that is when the Department of Insurances will step in and says, it sounds to me like you don't want to cover homes. You know, and 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 if they don't want to cover homes and right now it has created such a very hard market within like a a bunch of my buddies that are agents, carriers aren't looking to take on new risks. They're not looking to take on new policyholders. They're trying to get rid of them. And that is the one thing that you're going to see. And so public adjusters be very careful about filing, uh, you know, multiple claims or recommending that multiple claims get filed because if they have two or three within a policy period, period, they are going to be non-renewed and in some cases canceled, depending on the losses. And it's going to be very difficult for them to find new insurance. And if they do find it, it's going to be astronomically expensive. So don't go out there when they've got a loss that is south of $20,000, even though it's above their deductible, be very careful about advising people to file claims because it can adversely affect them, especially if it's due to any kind of negligence whatsoever. Be very careful. One of my metrics has pretty much always been 10 times the deductible. If they have something that is 10 times the deductible, that's where you want to get involved. That's where you want to sort of insert yourself. I am probably going to go up somewhere around 15 times the deductible only because deductibles are getting so much higher now. And yeah, and are. and our fees can really begin to wound some of these claims and the effective money that they have to repair it because payouts aren't going to get easier. They're going to get tougher and our fees are going to come into question. So, um, and that's why they're looking at fee caps. Our market is becoming even more difficult. In the previous episode, we talked all about fee caps and whether or not it was something that was in there because our fees can ultimately end up wounding the claim. And the best way to keep fee caps off of the table here is quit taking some of these claims that do not need your fee. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't help people. So this is where you're going to have to take an opportunity to educate a homeowner without necessarily direct representation. And this means you don't get paid. This is your pro bono effort, guys. Hear me. This is something that you should do is coach them through every phase of the claim. Answer your damn phone. Answer these questions on these twenty five and thirty thousand dollar losses and give them the information that they need to go out and fight and win and get paid. OK, and, and and be available to them, be a part of your community, be a support, be a help, be a resource that these people can call on. And I'm telling you, when it matters, they're calling you first. That's right. I was going to say that next. I was going to back you up on that and say this is this is a, a people driven industry. And, you know, where you help one, they know business owners, they know other people, they know other professionals, they know other homeowners. Word spreads. They want it. People want to go with people they trust or, or people that someone else they know trusts. Yep. So do some pro bono. It's good for you. 
I don't know if I ring the bell, but I'm going to ring it anyway. I may have already rung it. I don't know, but that 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 follows up the wrap up. I have got a really special announcement now that we're kind of done with that. Jess, thank you for such a great show. And ladies and gentlemen, let's just give her a round of applause right now on how awesome she is. I mean, I could not do this show at all without Miss Jessica Odell because you got what you guys don't know is that there is a fair amount of conversation that Jess and I get into prior to a show, and this girl gets in there and researches and digs. And um, what is the the Google thing that you use to go find this information? Um, go ahead and tell us. What is that again? Yep. So if you guys are ever looking for scientific type of information, you're, you're tired of looking through blogs and vlogs, and you you know you just want to see what is the science, what is what is actually being published as official, you know, science research. And that is Google Scholar. I used it in college all the time. Google Scholar, so you literally just go Google Scholar is what you do in Google and it'll pull up Google Scholar. Then you type in your search in Google Scholar. What that does is it scours the internet looking for official publications, whether it's government publications, scientific publications, and you know, uh, I find a lot from the American Society of Civil Engineering on there. I find a lot from other universities that are conducting research on various, you know, materials and construction methods and this, that, and the other engineering type concepts. There is a ton of information out there, even done on the impacts of hail to metal roofs, impacts of hail to asphalt shingles. Now I'll caveat that with some of it's free. A lot of it you have to pay like yeah maybe 20 bucks for or you know maybe 15 or maybe 10 so sometimes you do have to pay for these articles but that is forever yours to constantly reference and then it shows sure. the carriers it shows attorneys it shows even your homeowner this person is not messing around they are citing official scientific publications not just you know and, and no knock on any of our associations none uh, but, you know, just conversation through a blog that they found on a website or something. Again, that's not to knock that stuff. This stuff is good. It generates a lot of conversation. But if you really want to go to reference page two of such and such publication and then literally cite your source, it just adds that extra. Well, this this one of, one of the things that I talk about, one of the things that you'll often hear me talk about is unbiased third party documentation that really and truly this where this documentation actually had where studies have been done prior to this loss ever happening so it basically establishes sort of a a pattern of of the extent of damage that you're looking at or or whatever it is that you're trying to prove is a very powerful piece of documentation that is so far removed from the contracting or adjusting industry that that it's it's hard to argue with you know what i'm saying now i'm not saying they won't argue with it i'm not saying again i told you that if all you had to do is be right. This job would be a lot easier. And none of us do this because it's easy. We do this because we so thought it would be easy. easy. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, but but the idea here is, is these are resources. In, and I remember when I was a kid, uh, the Yellow Pages had a slogan called Let Your Fingers Do the Walking. Yep. Well, I think we should bring that back and get out there and research some of these things and make them part of your files, because the burden of documentation is not going to go down. It's only going to go up. And I'm I'm, ta I'm telling you, it will separate the men from the boys um, on this on this thing here as far as your files go. And I would inundate them with documentation. And that is how you prove things. And I'm going to tell you that even if you lose, when you hand it over to an appraiser or you hand it over to um, an attorney and that expert work is completed, yeah. that just basi basically makes their job so much easier. So your job is to prove the loss for whomever is there to carry it across the finish line. If it's not you, then the next person right. down the line. So we want to make sure that all of the parties that are involved, we got to do our job regardless 
regardless of the outcome. And I want to encourage you that I want to, I, I would, I want to officially announce, I know we've talked about it a lot, the control, the narrative event that is going to be held right here in Dallas, Texas on March the 5th. We are actually, I am now happy to announce, and you probably will have already heard it by the time you hear this recording, but it will be held at the Alamo draft house in Las Colinas, um, very close to DFW airport. Um, it's a great venue. It's actually a movie house. It's going to have, we're going to have the food. We're going to cover your food for this event. Um, I know that we're going to have a cocktail party afterwards. Um, we've got a lot of sponsors that have lined up to help us out. Um, all of that information is coming out very, very soon. Um, so if you have not had a chance, I am going to do a, um, you're going to see some videos coming out here pretty soon about the event. So I anticipate this thing selling out quickly, very, very quickly. By the time you've heard of it, um, by the time you heard it, uh, you know, we may already be sold out by even by the time this thing comes out. Baby Cakes has got something to say. She was trying to remind me of something. There are only 50 seats that are going to be available to this thing. What day, what day was this again? And what, that is Broadway? going... March the 5th, March the 5th is when this is going to go down. There's only 50 tickets that are going to be available. It is a very exclusive event. And I am going to be talking about, I mean, most of the time, it's not just my process. It is how I get it done. It's the actual tools that I use. So basically what I am doing is I am opening up my toolkit on how I deal with certain claim phases. Now, it will be lined out chronologically so that it makes sense, but it's not necessarily an A to Z, do it this way every time, wash, rinse, repeat. It is, as we, anybody who's worked claims know that each claim kind of has its own very unique DNA. And sometimes you need this thing, and sometimes you need that thing, and sometimes it requires this argument, and sometimes it requires that expert. You know, you don't really know, but the idea is, is these are people, anybody that you see at this event, um, the people that I've asked to sponsor it are people that I actually use on a daily basis, have daily conversations with, that have shaped and molded the way that I handle claims. I am so excited about this because these people, are truly and the people that I'm working with are truly passionate about helping you and helping your the homeowners that you represent effectuate the equitable settlement that not only they deserve but they've paid for and so this is a very big event I am looking forward to seeing so many of you out there I am going to be sort of on the show circuit you know between now and March 5th please come up and let me know if you bought your ticket if you see me at it the first one that I'm going to be at is just uh, is going to be at the uh, storm restoration um, the SRC summit um, that is put on by uh, a very lovely person, April Hall. She does such a good job. I, I like her so much. So if you see me out and about, please come up. Let me know that you've registered. And I look forward to seeing you guys. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And you can count on this. We will see you on the next one. Ready to ram you like the fire, slam a jammer. Yes. yes, we're coming up, don't even try to diminish it. I won't start it, but I damn sure will finish it.